All right, well, as we have people trickle in, so purpose of today um, is to really focus on whether or not you should raise venture capital. Uh, but before we dive in, I'll give you a little bit of background on Get Shit Done. You probably know me if you're, if you're on this um, or know of me. Um, but Get Shit Done really came from my experience as a three-time founder. So um, I have been self-funded. Um, I have raised a couple million from angels, venture capitalists. And from those collection of experiences that actually, um, hey, that actually led me to starting Get Shit Done. Um, and it was because what I was seeing in the system is that there were so, so many narratives around how hard it is for female entrepreneurs, but we really weren't talking about, um, well, why is it hard? And two, what do we do now? And typically what ends up happening is that we tell all these female entrepreneurs that, hey, go and raise venture capital. That's gonna be the thing that helps you and that's gonna get you out of feeling stuck. But that's actually not the problem for female entrepreneurs. Um, the, the more systemic barrier for us is that women make up nearly 50% of entrepreneurs. Our companies only bring in 4% of total business revenues. That is the fundamental issue that we're up against in the system. So when it comes to even talking about venture capital, it really doesn't matter um, for a lot of women at the stage they're at because they haven't gotten over that barrier where they de-risk the investment. But we'll get to that a little bit a little bit later. So what this really came out of is I, as I do very often, I went on one of my rants. Um, if you haven't checked out, there is an amazing, amazing article that Fortune did and it highlighted founders like Tyler Haney, the founders of The Wing, um, and said, are these founders who had raised venture capital, are they being unfairly targeted? And that was a resounding no for me. And this is a resounding no from someone who has raised venture capital as, first of all, a woman and a black woman. It is double hard, <laughs> like double hard. I did it, but I still said, no, they were not being unfairly targeted. And here's why, is that they played the same game that a lot of male founders do because that's the only the only blueprint that they see and so it becomes growth for growth's sake and then a lot of these founders who are vc backable like we'll go into that later about whether or not you're vc backable these companies are vc backable for sure in terms of you know how they wanted to scale however if you're not looking even if you do raise venture capital like these founders did if you're not looking at you know, if it's the appropriate vehicle for not only my vision and scale, but also is in alignment as we're scaling with the values of the company. And so that's why they weren't being unfairly targeted. A lot of the practices that they were doing, for example, Outdoor Voices was burning so much cash. If I were a shareholder, I would be like, yeah, it's time to find someone else that can, you know, take over here. And the other issue with this is that their shareholders, the VCs participate because they encourage growth, growth, growth. When you look up one day as a founder and you're like, how the fuck did I even get here? Um, so that's one of the main issues. And then um, the other problem here is that, you know, we can talk all day, every day about how to raise VC, but there's so many women out there that are doing it. But the biggest problem is that many founders are just not, this is not the appropriate vehicle for them. So that's what we're really gonna dig into today is to really understand is this the appropriate vehicle for your company? The, the, the how, there's so much out there. I'm happy to send you all these resources. I'm gonna give some examples of things you can look into as a resource as well. However, we need to really determine as female founders, what is the why? Why meaning, is this appropriate for my vision of how I want to scale and the values I have as a founder? If we do not determine the why here, we are going down a very, very dangerous rabbit hole where we lose control of our companies and the ultimate impact that we want to make because we can make, you know, the founders of the wing wrong or out the founder of Outdoor Voices or even we work wrong. They made a lot of missteps, but let me tell you, it is a product of the very system that tells them to do a lot of these missteps. So we'll get into that, but high level overview before we get in and Absolutely, we'll get into Q&A um, later because I want to make sure that we're addressing your specific questions. But um, I want to make sure we get over the high level things and some of these, um, some of what I go through 
it might even address what your questions are. So I'm just gonna go over a high level overview of really what is VC, how it works, so on and so forth. Um, and it's, I, I'm not gonna get into like the, the, the so nitty gritty stuff, but just a high level, high level overview. So what is VC? So VC is a venture capital. It is a form of private financing in exchange for equity, or in other words, ownership of your business. So if we're looking at venture capital in the early stage, that typically looks like three different vehicles or types of funding. So it's equity just straight up that you are exchanging a portion of your business for, um, for, for some cash, right? From an investor. Um, then you'll see things like convertible debt, which I've done before as well. Um, this is, I see this still in startups, but safe, which we'll talk about next, um, is starting to replace it. Convertible debt is just that it's debt. It is a form of, a form of financing that you need to pay back with interest. Typically though, in startups, it ends up converting to equity at a certain date, but it still has that interest. Um, and it's a little more complicated than what you see now, which are safes. So there's a lot of paperwork and things out there around this. Like YC has a lot of templates you can use where you don't even need a lawyer. Um, safes are not debt though. They're not convertible debt, but they do convert into equity in the future um and a lot of these things you can find yc has a really really good y combinator has a really good arsenal of information templates that you can check out um and safes tend to be less risky for the founder um and more risky for the investor but i'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty of that for the sake of today i just wanted to give you a high level overview of what does it look like to exchange um for ownership um, but if you really wanted to get to get into the nitty gritty of venture capital and understanding all the like ins and outs of the structures of deals or whatnot, highly recommend the book Venture Deals. It is like the Bible of venture capital for founders. Um, so if you want to get deeper into that, I highly suggest that. So what are the stages of venture capital? Um, I think this is something that we tend not to we, we tend to get really kind of confused about because of how it's used today. So there's seed stage, there's early stage, and then there's growth stage. So think of seed as the really, really early stages. This is when you're still figuring out things. Um, and then think of early stage as like, this is like the series A's of the world. This is when you already have like a good amount of traction. You're probably in the millions. And now it's like, we need to accelerate, right? Growth stage is when you're already moving and grooving, series being up usually. Um, and by that, that time, you have so, um, the book is called Venture Deals. Um, and by that time, um, this is more so, you've kind of proven out, and it's just to like grow, grow, grow. It's to just put more fuel on this fire. Where it gets super confusing today is the fact that it's seed stage, which is usually probably where the majority of you right now are thinking about um seed stage is becoming more and more confusing because if we take it back to like the 2000s in the 2000s a venture capitalist was not looking at like early early stage companies like where you barely had any revenue most of their capital was actually going on to follow on rounds of companies that had proven it out now you fast forward in the innovation space and you're seeing more early stage capital being deployed and so we have seed stage, which even when I raised, like I started raising in 20, my first time pitching investors, 20, 2010. Um, then I actually secured capital the first time, 2012 for my second company. Um, and I would say like the bar has even moved higher um, in terms of the stage you need to be at early stage. I would say seed stage is now you're in the like hundreds of thousands. And then now you have pre-seed. This is where it gets really, really iffy because pre-seed is actually, in my opinion, starting to replace what seed stage used to be, um, where you might not have as much. You have maybe in like the, you know, 20, maybe you're in like the tens of thousands and you're getting even early, like pre-revenue stage of things. I would say this is where it's less likely because I think we get into this narrative around, well, look at all these white guys that are raising capital. They have just an idea on a piece of paper. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but at least of the investors I know, they are not investing at just an idea stage unless you have receipts or they believe in you in some way. Does that create a barrier because of 
the type of networks that we might be or might not be um, in, in intertwined with. Absolutely. But of the investors I know, you need to have some form. You need to have had de-risk the investment in some way. So think about it this way. If you go to put money down on the stock exchange, right? And early, I mean, like startups are so much earlier, but typically you are not, first of all, you can't even get on the stock exchange if there's no historical performance, right? Um, but you don't want to put your money into a company that hasn't performed in the past, right? So that's kind of the same with startups is that the investor needs to have something tangible that they can really grasp onto to say that I'm willing to take this risk. And so if you are at the stage where it's, you know, idea, I see this very, very less likely. Those are typically the founders who have had a successful exit before or have some type of moat. They're the moat in their business. Meaning um, I take the founders of Gimlet Media, which sold to Spotify for I think 200 million. Um, the moat in that business was Alex um, because he had been in journalism for like 20 plus years. He had run like podcasting at NPR, one of the biggest, you know, um, you know, media companies, um, and he did it at scale. And so it was like, well, you're the person to do this. Right. And then by then he already had some traction. Right. So that's where it becomes very confusing because at the pre seed stage, a lot of founders are now assuming that pre seed means, Oh, I have an idea. I need capital get to get started. So where's my check investor? Most investors are not going to give you a check at that. They're just not going to give you a check off of an idea. Pre-seed is starting to move into that, that area of where seed used to be. You still need to have some form of traction. What does that mean? That typically means that you need to have some form of users, some form of revenue. And let's say if you have a tech product and you have not monetized yet, it's just to show that there is a demand here. And this is where it can be complicated because if you are high in like a very capital intense company, let's say if you're in the, the, um, the FinTech space or the medicine space, that's where leaning on traction or the moat of the founder background is really, really, really important. So that's where we're getting, we're misconstruing the situation right now. In my opinion is that we're saying, well, look at all these white guys that are going out to raise and they were able to do it and they didn't have any traction. Like the guys from Snapchat didn't raise until they had like a, an appropriate round until six, like they had like 600,000 users. Um, and that's not to say like they had their own wealth that they came from. That's a whole different ball around, but we're talking about institutional capital, institutional capital pre-seed stage is much harder to get, to get because you need to be really, really connected. It's already a, a fucked up network effect anyway. Um, but pre-seed used to be, and, and kind of still is, is angel round and friends and family. That's the way you should look at it. And I completely understand this is that most founders do not have access to friends and family. In my last company, there was no friends and family around from my end. Like friends and family were like, I'll give you a hug. Love you. Bye. Good luck. Like that's what they could do. I didn't come from that type of wealth um, for my friends and family to say, here's a check. Right. And so that might feel really, really fucked up because you're like, well, then how do I get started if I need the cash? A lot of times what's end up happening and this is my first time doing a live. So I'm going to see if I can freaking share this. Oh, it's too far. Never mind. We're not going to do that anyways. So, Oh, uh Oh, go back. So if you're looking at, you know, where capital for founders are usually coming to from, and I can send this to you all later in the follow up. Um, it typically is broken like this. There's crowdfunding and this was done in like 2015, but Crowdfunding, there's about 5 billion in 2015 was coming from crowdfunding, right? Then you moved up about 20 billion, 30 billion was coming from bank loans. And it's become increasingly harder to get a bank loan. That's a whole nother topic for another day because um, there's a lot of systemic barriers there. Then you go into um, the, the institutional capital. You have angel investors and VCs, both respectively at that time had 20 billion coming from them. The next thing here, the next pillar, was friends and family and i believe that was about 40 40 billion um but I'll, I'll follow up and make sure i have the numbers around this mind you this was 2015 but following the trajectory i'm sure it's not as far off the biggest pillar there biggest pillar there was from people's personal savings and credit cards 185 billion 
was coming from people's personal savings and credit cards. And this is where the, the whole idea of raising capital gets misconstrued because the majority of people are their own investors to start out with. So I think of the guys from Google, they were building Google for, I think it was like three years as accountants. And then they went full in. You have people like Sarah Blakely who did not raise at all. She owns hundred percent of her company as a multi-billion dollar company. Um, but she was slaying in fax, um, fax machines for like seven years. So I think what the system does to make us play ourselves is to make us think because of what we see in the, in these fast company entrepreneur mags of the world, they make us think that, Oh my God, look at that person that got a hundred million dollar check, but we don't really talk about what they did to get up there. So don't get it twisted. The majority of people put in their own cash, their own sweat equity from having a full-time job. I get you done. We have plenty of founders who are still full-time and growing their businesses because they have to be their own investor. Like there's not a friends and family round. Um, you also have um, people who are doing side hustles. I remember when I left my last company, my last company was doing millions. I wasn't making millions. And so I quit and then I went to start get you done. I had like a two month runway. I still had to put like money in to start up this business. And so I started consulting on the side for like a year where I was able to get in a cash position where then I was able to go and go in from the, and compliment the money we were making in the business to ramp up. So I don't want people to get it twisted, which often does is that I need money to start. That means I need to go an investor. That's very backwards to think of. Think of it as what am I able to do on my end through how I can make money to start this company up and I'm able to do it. Hey queen. And I'm able to do it at the, without spending so much capital to test things out. So that's the first thing. Think of institutional capital VC is to accelerate it. So uh, my friend tried to build a bonfire at my place in Brooklyn. And I remember he just kept trying to use the kindling. So of course, it ended up making it flame up. So kindling poured a lot of like fuel on it and it did a big poof like this and then it went down. So if you think of startups that are so early that haven't proved any, proven anything out, that's what would happen if we try to apply institutional capital like VC to them before they're actually ready. You're just gonna put so, like money into something and it's gonna poof and then go right back down. And it is so unsustainable. So don't get it twisted. Usually when you're starting up before you have traction, that means like revenue users, you need to put in your own, like your own capital, friends and family, your own, like from your side hustles, from your full-time job, like, and that's okay. There are so many people out there that are saying, Hey, if you're not doing this, if you're not, if you're sleeping, if you're, if, if you're not doing this, you're not going to be successful. Fuck that. If they aren't paying your bills, it is okay to be your own investor to start out with. So let's go into what type of companies are going to get VC. So honestly, any type of company can like not any type of company. Let me take that back. Any industry can get VC for the most part. So let's look at hospitality. You've probably heard this, that if you look at a mom and pop, you know, restaurant, your favorite restaurant, they're probably not a great fit for VC because they want to see some form of scalable exit. We'll get into that in a moment. Um, but if you look at, let's say a hospitality app, like a DoorDash, where they're basically putting things together, they're like the middlemen, they are able to scale because they are not limited to how much capital they can make in one location, right? And so don't think of it as it's just one industry, think of it as the potential to scale. So now let's go into the expectations that venture capitalists are looking for when they're investing in companies. So the first thing is when investors say that they want to have a long-term relationship with you, like this is a long-term partnership. The max horizon is 10 years, 10 years, because this is how venture capital funds work. They investors, those investors have investors they are called LPs, limited partners. It's all these people, or maybe one that put all their capital into one place. And what those venture capitalists said is that we promise to give you your money back in this year by placing bets on the right type of companies that are going to yield a return. And typically what that looks like is they want to see an exit within five to seven years, um, no more than 10. 
And an exit can be an acquisition, it can be an IPO, and they wanna see at least 10 to 30 times their money back, at least. Do you understand? I think when I talk to founders, they don't, I don't think they can fathom how quickly you have to scale for that to happen. That means from the moment your venture capitalist or your cap table of venture capitalists put in money into your business, they are looking for you to have some form of exit to get a 10 to 30 times their money back within five to seven years. Ask yourself, one, am I about that life, which usually founders are not about that life because you can lead to so many mistakes that we see in the startup system today. And then two, is my company set up to be able to make the impact that I want it to make within that time frame? Example is get you done. I raised capital in my last company that was the intention of we want to exit to like an Amazon or a Nordstrom. We want to do it within this amount of years. Yes, it was appropriate for VC. Get shit done. We're a social impact company. We are really addressing a systemic issue that is not going to be resolved for within five to seven years. I have investors that come to me often like, hey, you want to check? And I'm like, no, because we can't resolve the systemic barriers for female entrepreneurs not scaling their companies with revenue within five to seven years. So it easily allows me to say, Absolutely not. This is not the trajectory for me, but we'll get into those questions and how you can identify whether it's right for you in a, in a minute. So the upside though, let's look at, you know, the upside of VC because here's the expectations. Like one, we went over what is VC, the expectations that they have for you um, and whether or not this is going to be good for you. So the upside of VC is that when you do get capital in, let's say you have the traction, um, you have proven it out, and now you're like, we know where we're gonna put this capital to fuel the fire, to accelerate, because that's really where venture capital does its best. So when you're at that stage and you say, hey, this could be really great, we know what's working and not working and what to put money behind, and please don't do this, where founders are like, yeah, we know what to put money behind, it's marketing. Absolutely not. First of all, VCs fucking hate that. And if I were if I were de deploying capital right now and if a founder came to me and like, well, we just need money to test out Facebook ads, I'd be like, but did you, do you know if that's the appropriate audience for you? Like VC capital should never go towards, you're trying to figure out who your customer is. We know who this customer is. We know where to find them. Now it's about, we need to accelerate, add fuel to the fire and find more of them at once and quickly, right? So the upside of VC is if you already know that and you know where to add fuel to the fire, it's not just kindling, you've built the foundation, which is where you should actually get VC in if you choose that path. What it enables you to do is scale faster. I'll give you an example. My friend Rachel from Wethos, check out Wethos, they're amazing. Um, Rachel did not come from the type of background where she had friends and family around. Um, she was not, you know, didn't go to one of the fancy Ivy Leagues. Um, and it was her and her co-founders that put in their own savings. Again, that's usually where startup capital comes from, is from the founder's personal savings um, checking or it's coming from their credit cards. So Rachel, that's how her and her co-founders, they started up. Now, fast forward, when she went to find VCs, the way she did it was so badass. She didn't know any venture capitalist that was not her world. What she did was study them. She studied, okay, first of all, what investors in this space will invest in my type of company based on their past, right? So if you're not familiar and if you don't have a network, Rachel's a great example of this. I will give a caveat, she was in New York, so that is a little biased because a lot of capital does come from New York. But we are now becoming in a democratized space with venture capital because no one can go anywhere. The great thing about venture capital is so many of these, um, these funds, they'll tell you at what stage, what check size, what they've invested in in the past. Um, but more importantly, you can learn a lot about those um, investors at those funds because investors love to hear themselves talk on Twitter. They love it. Twitter is a place for investors. They love hearing themselves. They usually have blogs. So if you don't know any investors, you can go and find those lists. Who are the investors that invest in my specific space? Look around, talk to other um, founders 
who are also in your space and say, hey, founder to founder, you know, I would love to connect with this person. Like, would you mind connecting me? And a lot of times founders, if they're, you're cool with them, um, Clubhouse is a great one, great, great example. Um, they like to help other founders because they know the struggle. They know the struggle. Um, a lot of times too, VCs love getting introductions from their favorite, favorite, one of their favorites, not even just other investors, other founders they've invested in. They love getting introductions from there. So fast back, going backwards, Rachel didn't have any of that. So she went to Twitter. She started studying them. She started reading their blogs to hear about what did they care about? Because mind you, when venture capitalists, they're getting so many founders reaching out to them all the time. And a lot of times it's just icky, like BC seeing investors, please don't do that. That's stupid. If you're asking people for a shit ton of money, then you should absolutely be taking the time to write a, a individualized email to them. Um, but make it, don't make it a mass email, like personalize it. And that's where the, the research and your due diligence on them is really important. So what Rachel would do is say, Hey, you know, so, and so I saw that you wrote this piece. Hey, this is why I really love that and why it resonated so much with me. And then by that time, this is when she was still going to events and we could go to events. They could have a conversation. One, investors like anybody, we love when people like, like what we like. We love when people are like, oh my God, I love your expertise. And they're just like, oh my God, now I'm talking to another human, not just someone asking me for money. By the time they're done with their conversation, Rachel's just like, hey, you know, I'm sure you have a, you're have you busy. So I would love to follow up. I'm actually building something in this space and that's what we're trying to, that we're trying to um, attack. So um, do you have time for like a 15 minute call? And by then that person's just like, oh, this founder is not just trying to pitch me. I actually like them. I They like, you know, what I like, but also they know this space, which is what I invest in. And so fast forward, she raises her first, probably million, two million. Um, now she's about to go into her follow on round. I know the lead investor for, for that. And I remember their lead investor talked to me. She was like, I wish every founder would come to me the way that Rachel did. And what she did was they had built up more momentum because mind you, when they got their first $2 million check, they already had revenue, they had users, they had all of it. Now I was like, we need to go further. Now I was like, we need to get to the, the to the the earlier stage, more money on the more acceleration because we really know what's working. She was able to go to that investor and say, it's now a conversation. She's like, look, we're gonna hit numbers. That's not the problem. But if we got the check in, we could just go a little faster. And by then, the investor's just like, bet. Like you're like you don't even have to sell me on it because you already just told me you've proven that there's a market there. You already have momentum. You're gonna hit numbers anyway. But now it's just about going faster. So. What I'm trying to get at with that, like the upside of having money in from investors, you can scale faster, but you can't do that if you don't know what you're scaling. If you have not really figured out the traction levers in your business that will enable you to get to scale, venture capital is the most, it is the, the best suited for accelerating what you've already learned. It's not meant for you to figure things out. That's what you need to do on your own. The next thing for the upside of, of venture capital is it allows you to saturate the market. So just think of like, and this is later, this is like when you get to like the Ubers of the world, right? So if we look at the, let's say ride sharing, right? You look at Uber via Lyft, Uber's the big behemoth there. They really got into the saturate the market um, because their approach, their approach was like, we started with ride share, but really we're trans, we're trying to be a transportation company versus a Lyft that's like, we're really a ride sharing company that's rethinking what ride share means. So whereas Uber is like, we're going to get into aviation and all this other stuff, you know, Lyft is like, no, we're going to get into like bikes and things like that. So Uber was really, really set on, we're going to saturate the market big, big, big over here with transportation. Lyft was like, we're going to saturate it within ride share. And then the next thing is like upside, um, the, the top, one of the top things, I'm just going to give you the, the top things I see is talent, right? Is that, you know, what makes companies run effectively? It's not your fucking tech. Tech is like, a, a you know, that's secondary to the people, right? It's good, great talent and visionaries and founders and people that help them along the way that make amazing businesses. The issue is that you can't compete as a startup with a Google or a Netflix and how much they're paying. I think Netflix is like, I have a friend at Netflix and they're paying like, I, at least like they're in the six figs. Like 
that's dope as fuck but it's like if you're an early stage company you can't compete with those salaries but you want that type of talent right to make sure you're getting to the right place so that's really where venture capital comes in um and upside and it's an upside if you have identified that i one have a company that is able to scale as quickly and have an exit within at least or within five to seven years no more than ten um and then on top of that it's in alignment with my north star where the impact we want to make can we make that impact within that time and the values i have as a founder right so now here's the toxic side let's go to the other side the other side of this and what prompted me to do that rant on that fortune article was that a lot of companies in the vc space start growing for growth's sake because mind you you have a clock on you we need to exit within this time because it is now your fiduciary responsibility as a founder once you sign those term sheets you have now told your investors we are going to exit in this time with this return and give you this much money that's you have a it's your responsibility now like that is i i think i was listening to something the other day about airbnb's ipo and when they told one of the founders about it like i think he didn't realize where the stock price was and he was just like holy shit because it was higher than he expected and i'm pretty sure he's like we have to meet those expectations now <laughs> like holy crap it's amazing that they're valued that he's a multi multi-billionaire now but it's also like my fiduciary responsibility now is i have to hit those numbers right and so the downside of the growth for growth's sake is this goes back to identifying if this is in alignment with your North Star um, and in terms of where you want this company to go, is since you have that fiduciary responsibility and your investors are partners now, they are not just people that gave you a check, they own part of your company, they are partners with you in your business. You can't break up with them, they are there and they have somewhat of a say in it. And so if you don't hit certain goals and milestones, based on the expectation the you know the terms that you came to with your investors they have the right to say you're not the right person to do this job so fawn weaver she's the founder of um uncle nearest incredible story she raised 60 million from all inv individuals no vc she refused to do vc here's why she refused to do vc is that fawn is building a legacy business and usually people say legacy uh it's slow you it's you know mom and pop no legacy can be big it can be super big but it's about growing with more intention and a lot of times it means the founder saying i want to keep this for me and pass it down right so fawn even made a great point she was like i know that what every single one of my investors when they want to exit and i want to be the one that buys them out at that that point because she set it up so specific. It's like, I'm using this growth capital to get to the next level so that I can buy you out at that moment that you wanna get bought out. But she made another good point, and you can check out that, um, that episode we did with her on, our, on, on the Get Shit Done podcast. She walks through this, but she said, I seen it like clockwork. Another reason why I didn't um, choose VC was that I knew I wanna be the one running this business for a minute. And she was like, I've seen with founders, if, they are growing if they are growing a business and by year three like clockwork year three if they have not hit those goals that they have sat down with their investors and said we're trying to get here and they don't see it yet and maybe something happened in the market like a pandemic something you can't control now they're getting ousted this happens so often this happened to the founder groupon this i mean this this is like clockwork i think one in five founders get like ousted out of their companies but again, it goes back to you made an agreement with these folks and you can't control the external things that are happening. But they're saying, yo, clock, we need an exit within this time because we got to pay back homie over here, too. So what's going on? And it seems like maybe you're not the best person to do this. They have the right to say now we might need to find a replacement for you and oust you. Um, so an example of this happening, going back to that fortune article. Um, outdoor voices this happened to Tyler Haney they were girl they were burning through so much cost I think it was like two million a month or something like that um, again growth for growth sake it's so easy when you're acquiring customers throwing things out for you to get there and you look up as a founder you're like how do we get here how do we get here because you have to balance as a founder I've been here it is so hard you're trying to balance the vision you have for your business 
in, on, in, as well as balancing the expectation for your shareholders and you are grateful for them and you want to be able to to give them something back so a lot of times what ends up happening is we forget the vision and values we have and we just grow to grow and then we look up and we're like how did we get here right um the wing just had this in that article she even said i looked up we grew so fast and i didn't realize that we were now um we were now a toxic workplace for for black women and she was like it went against the very the very um values that i had right and now they're under fire right but it's a product of the system um another great example of this tristan walker from bevel he has a great great um interview on how i built this he started with venture capital and he says every single problem that i had in my business came from venture capital because again going back to what is your intention for how you want to grow this company and what does that look like what does success to you look like so if you're looking out today and if you could say that would be success look like i want you to think of not only how you're going to feel how it'll look but give yourself numbers give yourself is it a certain amount is it i want to have it within x amount of years am i there am i running it um because a lot of times that's where founders get confused so tristan walker was confused because he was building a legacy company bevel he wanted to be like i want to pass this down to my sons i i want to keep running this because we haven't really attacked the black beauty market for men and i want to be the one to do that because i think i'm the best person to do it but the nature of venture capital is we need an exit. We need an exit within X amount of time. And he was always butting heads with his, his VCs because what ends up happening is he's saying, we need to take time to figure this out. And VCs are saying, no, we need an exit. We need to get our money back. And we agreed upon that. They ended up exiting to P&G and he said it was the best thing that happened for their business because P&G said, you know what? You're gonna continue running this company within P&G as your own you know, because they're a legacy company. And he's, they're like, we don't know shit about the black, you know, male hair care, beauty, anything. You're the best to do that. You go up and do it. And, and he looks back and he's like, I wish that I would have known that before, right? But we're not talking about those alternatives. So I would say the toxic side there is growth for growth sake, which is out of alignment with the vision that the founder um, originally had and the values that they have and how it can get compromised when you're just growing so fast the other thing is when you are the earlier you raise capital the more money you raise the more you dilute yourself and here's the thing if you are doing entrepreneurship right you should be doing entrepreneurship to gain wealth otherwise go work for someone like there is no reason you should not be using entrepreneurship as a means to gain wealth to not only distribute that back into your family but also to distribute that into your communities and to make an impact because whether you like it or not we live in a capitalist structure and we can say it's fucked up and there's lots of things about it that are fucked up but there's a way that you can leverage it so then that you can do good with what you earn right so if you raise the earlier you raise the more money you raise the the more you dilute yourself and here's the thing is that you could have a hundred percent of your company if it's not growing then you know you can have hundred percent it's not valued as much but the way to look at it is again going back to your north star what do i want this company to be ultimately what does success look like to me what's the dollar amount am i still here so on and so forth and then really look at if you raise capital at what point you raise capital as you raise subsequent rounds because i'm going to tell you right now the more you raise or the, the the once you start raising you keep raising like and every round you raise the more you dilute yourself right and so you have to understand so if i want to own this much and we're valued at this and i think we're going to be valued at this one day what's that threshold for me can i if if i own let's say x percent would that allow me to achieve that number that goal that i really really wanted to do but the early you raise capital like even pre-seed the early you raise you have to realize and more money you raise you're diluting yourself currently um and and this is this is a, another thing we can get into another day but uh, just an example of this is the founder of facebook mark zuckerberg love him or hate him the guy owns 26 percent of that company still 
um, smart, and he has voting rights. That's another way you can get around it, is you better maintain a fucking board seat and have voting rights. Because otherwise, if you don't, they can ask your ass out of your company. Um, so those are other things, that's for another day. But the earlier you raise, the toxic side, another side of this is the earlier you raise, the more money you raise, the more you're gonna dilute yourself. And you should be doing this for ownership because entrepreneurship is such an amazing, amazing vehicle for you to be able to establish wealth for yourself, your community, and your family. Um, and then on top of that, the other toxic side is, again, going back to one of my original points, we are telling, we're, we're confusing the capital needs of a company um, with raising capital sometimes. Sometimes a founder is really just saying, um, I need revenue. And that does not mean you go and get an investor. That means you better go sell. Your number one job as a founder, as the CEO is sell. I tell our founders all the time, sell or die. If you are not selling, your company is dying. And that's the same thing with investors. When you're going to investors, you're selling. You have a fiduciary responsibility. So at the end of the day, we're pushing people down at the toxic side of VC and the conversation around it is we're pushing so many people down that path because they're saying, if you have capital needs in your company, go get an investor. The reality is that yes, 2% of funding goes to female entrepreneurs. Let's step out for a minute though. The sociologist, sociologist like nerd in me who always thinks through systems and how those systems work together to impact people is always thinking about what's the context here. The context is that that's 2% of like less than 1%. So within that context, it's hard and it's bad for female entrepreneurs to raise, but the reality is 99% of entrepreneurs will not raise venture capital because it's not the appropriate vehicle. And the missed opportunity here is it ends up mimicking the 1% we see, right? Is we're starting to create this narrative within the entrepreneurial ecosystem where the 1% is venture capital companies. But as we see with society, if we have a strong middle class, we all do very well. So there's nothing wrong with you having a company that's in the millions, 5 million, 10 million, 100 million. It doesn't need to be a fucking unicorn. I want to retire that word. I am tired of it because what it ends up perpetuating is that there's only be a select few of a, a few of you that will ever make it. We're going to hedge our bets there and good luck everybody else of you, mm, whatever. And then we remain stuck like we are today. And this is why female entrepreneurs are stuck at 4% because we're putting them down the wrong path. Venture capital is usually not the right vehicle for you. Um, and that doesn't mean there isn't other financing um, vehicles. We can talk about that on another day. But today, we're gonna focus on um, getting into those questions for the rest of this time, those questions and uh, what you should be asking yourself, and then you can ask me specific questions yourself. Um, I'm just gonna give you a couple, um, a couple examples you can look into because again, a lot of this is studying Studying the space, I understand it is very inaccessible. You can always hit me up, DM me, shoot me an email. I'm happy to, I talk to founders all the time. I'm happy to like, based on where you're at and what you wanna do, help you think through what you should be getting into. Examples of companies that are fucking crushing it that didn't raise, MailChimp. I'm sure a lot of you, a lot of you use MailChimp. Um, MailChimp is a massive, massive company. They didn't, they didn't raise a lick of capital. Um, then again, Spanx, she owns hundred percent of her company, multi-billion dollar company. Um, then there's examples of, um, again, you don't want to dilute yourself too early. There's examples of, you might have the right company for VC. I, I truly believe in venture capital if it's for the right type of company and it's in alignment with your vision and values, right? So I highly encourage you to look at the company, The Sill. It's a female founded company, S-I-L-L. -L. They raised, she's been doing this company for eight years. I don't think she started, she, she didn't raise capital until seven years in, right? And mind you, that's so powerful by then, she's done a lot of the work and she's gonna have more ownership of her company and be able to set the terms, right? So venture capital at the end of the day, um, to summarize, is really an incredible vehicle I, I believe in if it's for the right company. I have a lot of friends who are VCs and I love what they're doing, but the reality is that the majority of companies, it is not the right vehicle. Um, so questions to ask yourself to talk about or think through, should I think about raising venture capital, right? The first thing is always, what's your North Star? We always ask our founders, I get you done. They, we, even in our application process, when they, when they put together their traction plans, we have their North Star at the top of the page. Kathleen can attest to it. 
We were drilling in her the entire time. Any decision she made in her company, any decision our founders make in their company, we always make it go back to your North Star. What is your North Star? Where do you ultimately want this company to go? What's the ultimate impact you want to make, right? You're not just doing this to like, hopefully you're not just to, to make money because you can make money off anything. It's what's the ultimate impact. So if it's to make money, because I interviewed a woman out of Toronto the other day, she was like, I want to be the first millionaire in my company because you know what I can do with that? You know what I can do for my family and my community for that? Like you need to have such a strong North Star so you can understand, okay, with what I've built and the impact and the North Star we want to, we, we have, does this vehicle make sense for us? So an example of this um, would be again, going back to get you done, is that my former company, we wanted to exit. I was like, I want to exit within X amount of years. Um, I want to, you know, see, we can do it that quickly, but in Get You Done, we, that's not a reality because we are social impact. We are up against our barrier and our North, our North Star, not our barrier, our, our North Star is we want to increase the 4% of total business revenues coming from female founded companies to 20% in the next 10 years and then keep going off of that and off of that. That's not going to happen within five to seven years. It is a systemic change and I want to be the one to do it. So any VCs that are coming to me like, hey, how do you want to check? And I'm like, it doesn't work because that goes fundamentally against what I'm trying to not perpetuate and how we are trying to really add impact to the system. So that's the thing. First, ask yourself about your North Star. That is so, so important. Where do I want to go with this company? What's the ultimate impact that I want to make? And can we do that within five to seven years? No more than 10. Um, then look at it as, do I want to still be involved, right? Do I want to be sitting here running this company? Because, hi, mommy, love you. Um, but if you're saying, I want to continue running this, understand that you might not have that option, right? Um, and then again, how long? If you're like, actually, I want to exit within five to seven years. I think we can do it. We want to go fast. That's totally fine, too. VC might be a great vehicle for you. Um, and again, what I want to emphasize before we go into questions is ownership matters, y'all. I'm not saying 100%, but ownership meaning that you're using entrepreneurship, or I hope you are, using on entrepreneurship as a form to build wealth and bridge wealth gaps for your family, to pass it down, to build a legacy, to be able to impact your communities, to impact the world at large, because that's really where the beauty is. It's not just to make money for yourself, it's like what you can do with it. Because that's how the world works today is that it's a capitalistic structure so how can we make it more conscious how can we use it to our advantage to really serve the communities and the people we love the most so i'm going to stop there and i'm going to see what specific questions you have in regard to your company and what you're building okay we'll go through the comments who's up in here hello getting rid let's see Yes, building a hundred and fifty dollar company or hundred and fifty million dollar company is like legit. But we keep thinking about a billion dollar company and we're like, shit, if you're a hundred million and you own like you can have a billion dollar company and own like one percent, but if you have like a hundred and fifty million and you own a hundred percent, I think that's pretty legit too, right? Yeah. So if there's no questions around this, hopefully I covered the, the gamut around the why, that's really the intention of this, was to go over why. Why should you be considering VC, um, venture capital? Is it the appropriate vehicle for you? Um, get really clear on that because otherwise, we can give you all the tricks, the tips, the tactics, but if you have not really gotten clear on why, you will literally go down a rabbit hole and you will lose control of the very vision and impact you wanted to make with this company. Um, let me see here, you put in a question? Have, okay, Kathleen's question is, have you seen VC work for any mission-driven companies? That is a great, great question. So, mission-driven companies, absolutely. Um, I can think of, actually before I say absolutely, let me think back. Um, to mission driven companies. Nothing's coming at a top, top mind right now. Huh. I'm going to get back to you on that. I don't think I have. I mean, I know there are, um, but not that I can think of right now, but great question. Um, 
What is your take on raising capital to fund engineering? Tricky if you don't have a tech founder. Great example. Um, and Cheryl, I highly encourage you to connect with Kathleen, who is a non-technical founder who had to build out tech. Um, so the first, first thing I would say in regard to that question is that typically at that stage, like institutional capital, like capital, they want to see that you've already built it out. And that's annoying, right? Because techs can be expensive. So that's where having like a minimum viable product, like there are, y'all, there are so many tools out there. Like I got talked to a founder today. She's like, I'm building my website right now on Squarespace. And we build out a community and all these plugins that we use and it gets the job done. It's not the beautiful tech that we wanted, but it got the job done. Now she has, you know, 250 users paying her monthly to use it. So now she can use that as leverage to go to investors and say, hey, we need to build out proprietary technology for this um, and we need the capital to do it, right? Um, the other thing that you can do from an engineering perspective, which I've done in both of my former companies with CTOs, um, is you get a technical co-founder. So that's another way around it. Just get clear if that's what you wanna do. Um, if you wanna be a, a co-founder or a solo founder, I've seen that work really well where you're not paying cash up front and if that person is alignment with your vision, is passionate about what your mission is, that can work really well too. But that is really tricky. The one thing I will say and, and that I see founders do often is they are building out tools and tech when they don't even know what they are need to build out yet. And so it's like, we're just gonna build tech. And it's like, but for what? Do you know what your users have said? So on and so forth. So I would say venture is usually like, we wanna see something. We wanna see the users and the revenue there before we're gonna in invest in this really fancy technology. Um, there's a lot of platforms that, that are out of the box now that can help you do that. I'm hearing more and more seasoned founders who have um, built co companies, exited, um, including myself where I'm like, I am not building like from the ground up to start with anymore. I'm doing out of the box. And then as we learn from our community, as we learn from our customers, we will know what those specific things we need to be adding are going to be. So um, I hope that answered your question, but there's a lot of ways around it. But typically venture capitalists want to see something unless it's like you have the, the experience, you have the moat, um, and you have a very, very clear, very clear um, understanding of where you want to go. But typically, that's not the stage venture capital comes in is, is to fund the tech. The, they'll fund the technology once you already have the users and the, the revenue, right? But happy to answer any um, further questions offline about that. Um, is there a point from, it's Elizabeth, is there a point in the journey of a startup that these are, hold on, these are most vulnerable to abandoning their, their values? Yes, great, great question. I did it. I did it. And it's and if you want, you can always Google. I put up my resignation letter. I made it hella, hella public for my last company. Um, the more capital we got in, it meant now that you have a clock on you, right? Again, it goes back to when you raise capital, you have a fiduciary responsibility. But when you're a first time funded founder, like I was in that company, my first company, you know, when I was 19, I was pitching um, investors, but we didn't raise and it ended up fan like that company failed too. Um, is that you know once we got to that stage as a first time funded founder i was like okay now we have to go really fast and i completely abandoned what the ultimate vision i had for it and who we wanted to serve but also what values i had and i looked up one day and i'm like who does this help right for me personally i can't speak for my former co-founders but for me i was exhausted in my own company um I just remember thinking about the numbers all the time, the numbers, the numbers, but I'm just like, the reason we start, like it's always those gut feelings. And I think it's, it's easy for us to say the data here, the data there, compliment the data with what you know in your feeling, right? That is the most important place to be because most of the best decisions I know, any founders I know who have done it um, and who are doing well, the best decisions they've ever had um, or made is when they do it from they felt it. And then they use the numbers to back it up. But I think what ends up those values misalignment is when you're chasing profit and purpose is nowhere to be found. So I would say that's kind of the stage. And it's usually when you start growing really fast um, and you get those checks in. So I would say having that constant check in um, with yourself and your team to just be like, just remind yourself. And again, with our founders in their traction, 
um, goals and their, their spreadsheets. We keep North Star at the, the forefront so they remember every day they see why we do what we do so they're not making decisions that are misaligned with that vision and those values. Um, so great question. Um, okay, get rented. What are your thoughts on using debt to help scale? Um, it depends on the type of debt, um, but if you're talking about venture capital debt, um, it's a, I, I find the founders are doing more safes now, and if you have like a specific type and you want to clarify, put them in comments, but um, I'm finding more founders going to safes instead of convertible debt. I did convertible debt at my last company for one of our rounds, um, and mind you, it has interest. It has interest on it. Um, it's a little trickier, but if you're talking about debt like loans, um, honestly, loans can be cheaper than venture capital. And I think we don't talk about that again. And this is a conversation for another day. There are a lot of barriers of getting bank financing now and getting debt from, um, from banks. There's so many messed up barriers because they're the, the, it just keeps going up and up. Um, but I would say a lot of times like do not discredit, um, and actually right now is probably a good time to do it, but don't discredit bank loans and debt in that regard. Um, because a lot of times it ends up being cheaper long term than doing venture capital and you actually maintain your business. So from a debt perspective, it's, it's, it's not bad. And also debt, um, let's go back to the originally what I said in terms of where funding early on is coming from. It's coming from founders in their own pockets. Y'all are your investors. Don't forget that. Like it's coming from 185 billion coming from people's personal savings and credit cards. There are so many founders who know their stories and they're just like, oh my God, I had so many credit card bills. And that's scary as shit, I understand that. Um, but that's a form of debt that many founders did have to take on. So don't discredit those. It's not just venture capitalists, okay? Um, I've only seen one VC that is about this or says they are, okay, Miss Kathleen. Uh, da, 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 da. What else, what other questions? Oh, hey, it's lit. Y'all lit in here, I love it. Y'all better talk to each other. Awesome, very cool. So if there's no other questions, I know we're at five o'clock and I wanna be mindful of everybody's time. I'm so grateful, first of all, that y'all tuned in. Um, th there'll be a replay, we'll keep this on um, our channel um, as an um, Insta Live or an Insta, whatever they call it. Um, but. Um, if you have specific questions for me, I'm accessible. I love talking to founders. Um, hit me up. You can slide in my DMs. I will tell you sometimes I am slow as fuck. Um, yes, I will save Kathleen. It will be on, um, what is that thing? The, the movies or the watch, rewatch, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, you can hit me up, slide in my DMs. You can hit me up, email alex at shegetsshitdone.com. It might take me a bit because it's Q4 craziness, but I'm here to help you as much as I can. I hope you all have a fantastic Friday and weekend. Um, you're killing it. Like VC is not the only way. Um, hopefully I answered your questions. If I didn't, make sure to hit me up. Happy to do that. Um, and happy holidays. Love you all.